today we're going to be talking about acoustic echo cancellation. My name is Chris Painter. I'm one of the senior technical sales engineers here at Symmetrics. And uh, I am excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects here, conferencing. Okay, so let's just launch right into it. So first things first, this subject we are talking about, acoustic echo. So what is acoustic echo really? Basically, acoustic echo occurs in a conferencing system when the far end caller um, comes out of the speakers in the room, and that gets picked up by the microphones. Then it gets transmitted back to the far end. Um, that signal is like a delayed version um, because of the acoustic echo, the delay that happens coming through the wires, coming out of the speakers, getting picked up by the microphones, and going back to the far end. And the far end caller hears themselves back like an echo. So that is the problem. So then we have acoustic echo cancellation. And that is what this is all about. Um, acoustic echo cancellation, or AEC as I'll call it, um, it basically prevents that unwanted delay from being transmitted back to the far end caller um, after it gets picked up by the near end mics. Um, the AEC, it, it removes unwanted material from the near end mics by canceling it out basically against a reference signal. And the reference signal is what gets removed by the AEC algorithm. Um, so, and it prevents that from getting sent back to the far end. Okay, so let's talk about the hardware um, that we're going to be using for this. Um, we have our flagship product here, the Radius NX, which comes in two different models. Um, we've got a four in, four out, and a 12 in, eight out model. Um, both of these units can be configured with our AEC coprocessor module, which can give you up to eight channels or 16 channels, respectively. Um, they also have USB audio built in that you can use with soft codecs and recording and playback. Um, we also have uh, a dedicated routing a uh, function with the Radius NX called the Super Matrix, which gives you up to 128 by 128 routing. Um, we've got the four port gigabit switch built in um, and ultra noise, ultra low noise uh, mic preamps with three dB gain steps. And then we also are still supporting our optional card uh, slot options as well. Okay, so here's a zoomed in picture of the AEC coprocessor. And again, this comes in a single or dual coprocessor version. Um, so we decided to do this when we released the Radius NX instead of having a dedicated AEC model. Um, basically the two uh, models of Radius NX 4x4 and 12x8 can be configured with the single or dual core AEC um, coprocessor card um, when you purchase it. And again, that gives you eight channels with the single core or up to 16 channels with the dual core. Okay. So we do also still offer our AEC expansion card. Um, so this gives you four additional mic preamps um, with four channels of acoustic echo cancellation built in so that you can expand that. And so with this, you could possibly have up to 20 channels of acoustic echo cancellation in a single box. And this gives you all the same specs that you would have with Radius NX, um, ultra low uh, 11 millisecond AEC latency, um, high tail length up to 300 milliseconds. Um, so then another option that we have is our USB card. So again, the Radius NX itself actually comes with USB audio built in, um, but we do have the USB card option um, as well. And it's all the same specs that uh, the built-in USB gives you. Um, you could use it as, you know, for two by two or up to eight 
eight by eight channels um, if you were doing like a multi channel recording and playback kind of thing. Um, or in a conferencing scenario, a lot of times you're using it in one by one mode where it's just a single channel in and out. Um, and that could be used if you're doing, you know, Zoom calls or blue jeans or Skype or whatever it is. Um, now, one really cool thing about having the card option um, is that you could install this in a Radius NX where you're using the one Radius NX for two totally different rooms. Um, or you could use the built-in USB for one room and then the optional USB card for a second room. And then one DSP can handle both of those rooms in that case. Another option is the uh, analog telephone interface card. Um, this is a two-line card um, that would work with a normal POTS connection. And uh, this gives you all the kind of standard functionality that you would expect to have um, with this, um, including speed dials, redial, you know, DTMF decoding, caller ID, um, all of that kind of stuff. And here's a, a quick look at the interface for that. All right, then we also have our voice over IP card. Um, the Voice over IP card supports, you know, Cisco, Avaya, Asterisk, basically any SIP 2.0 compatible um, call manager um, should be compatible with our VoIP card. And again, this gives you all the uh, the, the stuff that you would expect to see as well that you could use for conferencing. You can use it for paging, you could use it for remote monitoring um, or broadcast. Um, one other thing to point out, um, because it's a two line card, each actual line actually has two separate call appearances. So you could have two callers calling into each line. Um, you could use one card for two totally separate rooms, or you could use both lines for a single room and have up to four callers all calling into the same room. As definitely another way to that it can be used. You can also use it as a, of course, as a three-way call with the local local person and two two far end callers. Okay, here's what the uh, the interface looks like. It's very similar to the analog telephone interface cards interface. Um, and this has all, all the stuff you would expect to have, hold, resume, transfer, do not disturb. You can join and split call appearances here. Okay. Um, it's also important to point out uh, that it works with DHCP, or you can assign static IPs to it as well. It's compatible with quality of service or VLANs. Um, it also uh, features the wideband audio codec G722, and we also have narrow band options. Um, the digit map is uh, customizable. Um, for off-hook dialing as well, and also DTMF decoding is is uh, compatible. Okay, so let's go back to AEC. So in the Radius NX, um, you know, getting back to the AEC thing here, a, the AEC the algorithm removes echo and noise from each input based on the signal that is routed into the corresponding reference node. And so I've got a couple different uh, input and output configurations here on the screen um, that you can see. The current maximum size that the module can be is eight channels. Um, so in the case where you had a Radius NX with the dual coprocessor card, you can do 16 channels, you would have two eight channel echo cancelers. Um, the, and then you can also um, configure this in a way where each channel has individual references. And the current maximum size for that is six by six. 
Um, so you can see that at the bottom left here, where I've got six inputs, and each input has an individual reference. Um, each module offers inputs, reference inputs, and outputs for sending to the far end. Um, it's configured when you place it into the site file. Um, the reference inputs provide a reference signal to the AEC input, which will then remove the signal before sending to the corresponding output. The signal would typically be the voice from the far end. That's the most common thing. Most designs can use a single reference for all inputs. Um, this is because in a typical conference room, all microphones are hearing the same reference signal. Uh, if that's not the case, then additional references can be added to accommodate that situation. Um, in this screenshot, what this is showing you is how that affects the tail length. Um, so the more references you have and more channels you have, that does bring the uh, tail length performance down a little bit. Um, even with the lowest, which you can see 180 there, um, is still going to be good enough for uh, a really echoey room, um, large room. So uh, I wouldn't actually worry about that too much. <clears throat> okay, here's a quick screenshot of what that would look like. Um, the eight channel um, acoustic echo canceller module with a single reference. And then let's zoom in and talk about what the individual um, functions here are. So we're zoomed into a single channel here. And we've got the enable button that basically turns echo cancellation on and off. Um, that can be used as an A-B test. Um, and then we've got the CNG button. That stands for comfort noise generator. Uh, that button will enable and disable it, the comfort noise generator. Um, this basically adds in some noise uh, during silences to let the far end know that the call is still connected. Um, in previous uh, Symmetrics DSPs, C we didn't have a CNG button. Um, we just always had comfort noise on. Um, and now with the Radius NX, we've basically added a button to enable it or disable it depending on your needs. Um, in most applications, you do want it on um, because basically the sound quality is so clean and quiet, um, especially in a lot of VoIP applications um, where the far end caller might actually think that the call got disconnected because there's no noise. So <laughs> it is there for a reason and it is actually um, applicable in most situations. Um, the reset button, this actually resets the AEC algorithm, forcing it to reconverge completely from ze a zeroed value. Um, additionally, this button resets the AEC meters, such as the ERL, ERL, E, and TER. Toggling AEC enable enable uh, basically freezes the algorithm at the current value, or it starts the algorithm with the most recent readings. So only reset will fully purge all the readings from the AEC algorithm. The reset key on any given channel will reset the convergence on every channel on the card. So that's an important caveat. Okay, the reference drop down menu, this allows you to have your choice of which reference input that you're choosing. So um, if you say you had a six input uh, acoustic echo canceller module with six individual references, you can actually still select which reference you're using um, per channel. So that's kind of cool. The ERL. ERL, ERLE, and TER meters are important when you're setting up the system, um, and they're important to kind of understand what they're doing. And the ERL meter, I think, is the most important, really, of all of them. Um, it stands for echo return loss. And this basically is the difference in signal level between the audio which is present at the reference input and the audio measured in the room by the microphone on this channel. A negative value indicates a loss and demonstrates a good system performance. The target ERL level is somewhere between zero and minus 18. 
so and we're going to talk about this a lot more later but if it's uh, much lower than minus 20 or if it's at zero or above zero that could basically indicate a gain structure problem we're going to talk all about that later in the webinar here okay the erle meter um, just stands for echo return loss enhancement it's basically the amount the aec algorithm was able to reduce the echo um, so if it reduced the echo by minus 50 or minus 60 dB, then that's what that meter is going to show. Um, the TER stands for total echo reduction. And this is actually the sum of ERL and ERLE together. Um, the echo reduction introduced by the room acoustics or ERL and the AEC algorithm, the ERLE. Okay. So the TER is usually going to be lower than the ERL, ERLE meter. Um, when the gain structure is correct. Okay, a couple more things in here. We've got nonlinear processing or NLP. This is best described, I think, as sort of like a fancy ducker. Um, it works to remove any residual echo that the AEC algorithm might have missed. Um, so like if you've got everything sounding great and just every now and then a little echo seems to slip through to the far end, that's where NLP could actually come in pretty handy. Excessive NLP can adversely affect double talk, though. Um, there's three settings here, low, medium, and high, and it's on low by default. Noise cancellation. Um, this is the level of attenuation implemented on a constant room noise. Um, if you've got HVAC sound or if one of the microphones happens to be hanging down right next to a projector um, or something like that, where there's a constant hum or buzz or something like that, that's where noise cancellation really comes into play. Um, that can actually cancel a specific constant noise out like that. AGC is an automatic gain control, um, which is kind of cool that it's built in to each uh, um, acoustic echo cancellation channel. Um, it's pretty handy to have there. But that basically is a dynamics processor. It takes signals of, of an indeterminate level up to a target RMS output while maintaining the dynamics. Okay, And we'll talk a little bit later about when and you should use that and maybe when you shouldn't use that. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is that it is certainly possible that you could use the AAC module just for noise reduction. So if you actually don't need acoustic echo cancellation, but you want to use the noise reduction feature only, then you could simply leave the ref input unconnected, turn off the echo cancellation enable button, and turn on the noise cancellation enable button, and you can use that as a standalone. Uh, processing. Kind of cool. Uh, some quick notes on the DSP usage. All channels of AEC in the radius NX execute wideband acoustic echo cancellation, which is 20 hertz to 20k. That's implemented by a dedicated chip actually uh, that's present on the AEC coprocessor card. So that means that using the AEC does not deplete any DSP resources at all. Um, it doesn't take anything away from the rest of the composer site files DSP processing percentage, if that explains that. Okay, now we're going to talk about some actual site file routing here. Um, this is my little checklist on uh, the, the four main things that you need to think about when you're building a a conferencing site file using acoustic echo cancellation and basically what goes to where okay so first things first the aec post-processed microphone channels though you need to make sure that those are only used to go to the far end collar you would never want to use those for local reinforcement in the room because there's 11 milliseconds of latency um, the direct versions of the mics, meaning non-AEC processed version of the microphone, 
ones if you need it. That would be what you would use for local reinforcement or voice lift, um, because again, there would not be that 11 milliseconds of latency. So for so you wouldn't have that uh, delay. <laughs> Uh, the far end caller coming in, that is going to actually come out of the speakers in the room, and that needs to go to the reference because, again, that's what the microphones need to cancel out to keep uh, the far end caller from hearing themselves echo back. Okay, then any other kind of source audio, like if you're, you've got PC audio playing from PowerPoint presentations or things like that, or if you've got um, any other inputs like a Bluetooth, you know endpoints or anything like that, that basically goes everywhere. So you're going to want that to come out of the speakers in the room. You're going to want it to go to the far end caller um, so they can hear what's happening in the conference. Um, and it also needs to go to the reference. Because if it's going to the far end caller, but also coming out of the speakers in the room, then you want to cancel that so they don't hear it sounding weird. It doesn't, they don't hear it as an echoed sound. OK, cool. and then. Let's talk about, um, actually, I'm going to stop there. I see a question in there. How can you know if the ERL, ERLE settings are OK if you cannot hear its benefits on your own room? You have to talk with some other room. It's not that kind of OK. So yes, when it comes to setting up an acoustic, uh, when it comes to setting up the acoustic echo cancellation, you can't really dial that in without actually establishing a call with somebody on the other end. You know, the ERL and ERLE actually won't do anything until there's an active call, until there's echo to actually cancel. So hopefully that answers that question. But I'm going to talk a lot more about how to di dial in the ERL and ERLE later. So hopefully we can come back to that. Uh, one more question here. Um, if I want to use the noise cancellation function only, does it still need the AEC card? You do need a Radius NX with an AEC coprocessor card or the AEC uh, four channel expansion card to use the noise cancellation. Yes, the noise cancellation only exists um, with the uh, with one of those two hardware units. Will noise canceling reduce overall audio quality when enabled? Um, no, it basically learns the sound. Uh, like if you've got a buzz, like HVAC sound, like a low rumble, um, it basically learns what that is and it kind of cancels that out. Um, but no, you don't really have uh, too bad of any any residual side effects on the, on the sound quality there. It's usually better using it than without it in a situation like that. Um, OK, so moving right along, um, we wanted to talk about some actual AEC routing now. Um, so here is a super, super basic site file. Um, so using the four items on the reference routing checklist, we can check our routing um, using this site file. and just doing all the routing with a matrix mixer, OK? So oops, let me click back on my screen here. Here we go. OK, so the AEC, you can see the red line there where that's going. AEC post-processed microphone, that should go to the far end collar only. OK, and then direct microphones. So this is non-AEC process microphones, as you can see there. It's basically, I've got that wire wrapped around, so it's a dry signal. It does not have the AEC processing on it. That's what you would use for voice lift in the room if you were doing that, if the room was big enough for it. And you probably would use that for recording um, if you were going to be doing any recording of the room. OK, and then the far end caller coming in, um, they are going to go to the local speakers in the room. And they're getting routed back to the reference. 
And of course they'd get recorded too if you were doing that. I sort of threw the recording in there as one extra, extra little uh, consideration. Okay, and then finally, uh, uh, any PC audio or presentation audio, that's gonna go everywhere. So that's gonna go to the speakers, it's gonna go to the far end and the reference and see how that all works. So that's in its simplest form, that is a conference room, okay? Now let's uh, do a slightly more comp complicated uh, and more typical setup. Um, here's a Radius NX 4x4 um, using four channels of uh, Assure MXW APT4. So these are gooseneck, uh, wireless gooseneck microphones that could be placed on a conference table. And they're coming into the Radius NX over Dante. And here's what the site file looks like. <clears throat> um, so you can see the Dante flow, the microphones are coming in over Dante. Those are going through the acoustic echo canceller, canceller module. They're being auto mixed and going um, to the USB connection to the far end collar. Now the far end collar is coming in down here at the bottom left. Um, they're getting mixed with any presentation audio. And I've got a speaker manager here and gain adjustment. Basically, if you're, you need to tune the speakers in the room or if, you, if the end user needs volume control, um, that, is, that is basically going to the speaker. And then after all of that processing, we're tapping off of that wire and going up to the reference input. Now it's important to point out that if you are doing any tuning of the room with EQ or dynamics processing, that you do want to um, have that reflected in the reference. The most important thing of all is if the end user has volume control. If they're turning the speaker up and down in the room or if they have control of that, that needs to turn up and down the reference at the same time. That is a very, very important thing. If it wasn't like that, then as soon as you turned the speaker up or changed the gain structure and the reference wasn't aware of that, then you might have echo that slipped through. So doing it this way, um, it always keeps them um, in tandem. So here's a visual representation of what that looks like. The near end mics are not sent to the local speakers in the room because the room is small enough that each of the near end participants can hear one another speaking naturally. Uh, when the far end audio is played through the near end speakers, it bounces around the room. That's where the acoustic echo comes in. And then it re-enters back into the microphones and it gets mixed with the near end speech in the microphones. And that gets back sent, sent back to the far end. And that, that can be heard as echo to the far end caller. So to prevent that, the far end signal is sent to the reference input, um, as you can kind of see in this picture by the little stop sign. And the AEC algorithm compares that signal to the near end mics and it removes the reference or the far end from the signal path and it prevents it from getting back to the far end. Uh, so they do not hear themselves echo back. Okay, the reference input must take a signal from as close to the physical outputs as possible. Um, this way the AEC algorithm will be aware of any processing taking place on the far end. We talked about that. It basically just provides a more accurate model of the room. Now, here's what you would not want to do, okay? So you never want to insert nonlinear dynamics processing or volume control, especially um, after the reference pickout point, because then the reference won't be able to track with what's actually happening in the room properly. So in this example, notice that the same reference signal is used for all four channels. Uh, unique references are usually only required uh, for much more complex systems um, that could be impl implementing like a mix minus situation where local reinforcement or really large rooms or room combining or time alignment of speakers is happening. Um, but in most cases where you've got all the microphones just in one room, in most cases, they can share a single reference. 
Okay, so in this next example, um, we're, getting, we're again using the four near-end microphones um, being auto-mixed and getting sent back to the far end. Uh, the biggest addition to this conference room is that we're going to pretend it's big enough that we're going to actually do local reinforcement. Um, so this is going to be common in, in larger rooms. If if all the participants in the room cannot hear the talker naturally, it may be necessary to locally reinforce the talkers. Okay, so the direct non-AEC processed near-end signal is routed to a second auto mixer here, and its output is mixed with the far end signal, as you can see. Um, the gain module here, this allows us to adjust the near end far end balance with individual volume adjustments and then the master volume control uh, would be used to maintain a constant interval between the room volume and the reference so again if you need to adjust you know the channel one versus the channel two's volume to get that relationship correct during integrating the system and then the end user would actually have the master volume on that gain module. I'm talking about the gain 225 there. Uh, that's what the end user would actually control. And that would keep the, uh, again, the, the difference between the uh, local reinforcement and the reference signal the same. A stereo compressor is used to make sure both the near end and far end signals have the identical processing. A stereo speaker manager module is also used in this case. Um, so any EQing done to the room is the same for the reference in this case. And then finally, at the very, very end of the chain here, before the speaker outputs, a summer module is used that ultimately combines the near end and the far end signals together for the speakers. Since the near end and the far end signals get summed for the local reinforcement, we can't pick off the reference signal directly before the physical outputs um, because this would result in all of the signals being canceled by the AEC algorithm. So we can't send the microphones themselves to the reference because then we cancel the microphones out of the microphones. <laughs> and we don't want to do that. So we only want the far end going to the reference. So we have to pick off the reference before the summer module. Um, although this isn't picking off the reference point right before the physical output, it still follows the most important rule here, which is to never use nonlinear processing or volume control after the reference pickoff point. It still allows for the best possible AEC performance, though, given the fact that there is a simple module placed after the reference. It's just summing. Um, but, but again, any compression limiting or expansion or volume control that is gonna be used for the near end speakers should be applied to the reference as well. Okay. Um, in this example, it's basically the same exact site file, but if you wanted to actually EQ each microphone individually, this is showing how we could use stereo EQs so that I can actually route the pre-processed and post-processed version of the microphones through the same EQ. You can see the red wires there is the post-processed and the blue wires there are the pre-processed for local reinforcement. So that is uh, best practice on how to do that. Um, Juan's asking, why not take the reference after the summer? Um, so I did try to explain that because we were summing the microphones for local reinforcement right before the speaker, and we wouldn't want the microphones going to the reference because that would cancel the microphones out of the microphones. So that's why I'm doing it that way, Juan. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I did want to uh, talk about the the AEC card, um, which is similar to our legacy products like the Radius AEC, um, where we didn't have a dedicated AEC module that you placed in the site file. The way that it works is you actually have three modules uh, 
um, for it. You've got the AEC input module over there on the left, and that gives you the AEC output and the direct outputs. Um, and then you have a separate reference module that would be placed somewhere in the site file that would receive the references for each channel. And then we have the AUGS inputs, and that would be used in the in a case where you had the Dante Dante microphones that would connect to the AUGS inputs. So it's important to point that out. Um, I basically just explained what the three modules do here, but here it is an example that shows the difference between the two routing. Okay, so here is a Radius NX that also has a four channel AEC card. Uh, we're using the coprocessor card in the Radius NX for one room, that's the green wires. And then we're using the AEC card in another room, okay? And that's the blue wires. So you can see the difference here of how those have to be routed. So that might be one important thing to be aware of. Um, that could throw you off if you're not familiar with how we used to do it and the old radius AEC and everything like that. Um, so I'll let you kind of look at that. So you'll see that with the radius NX, we do have to use the acoustic echo canceller module. Um, and then we're bringing the reference signal back with the green wire up to its references. And then with the AEC card, again, that has the three individual modules. So I've got the um, AEC outputs and the direct outputs coming from its input module there. Uh, with the blue wires and then the uh, reference module down at the bottom right that's receiving the references for the four channels okay so that's the difference on how that that would work uh, one more site file example here before i move on um, is combining okay so there's lots of ways this can be done um, this I think is the best way to do it, uh, where when you have, if you're using the same DSP for two totally different rooms, okay, but those two rooms need to be totally separate sometimes, maybe there's an, a, wa a wall that closes to seal them off and then the wall opens and then they need to become one big room. Um, I think the room combined modules are the way to do that because um, all, because of all the linked control functionality that it can do under the hood. Okay, so you can see we've got two rooms here. Each room has the four channel acoustic echo canceller module. Um, it's got some processing and then it goes, each one goes to an auto mixer. And then the room combined module is what is um, actually managing the the combining and uncombining okay so in an uncombined mode the two rooms are totally separate and when the combiner module combines it's combining both rooms inputs together and in addition it's also linking the two auto mixers into one larger auto mixer so that's how you would you would do that um, so notice there's two room combined modules here one on the top, one on the bottom. The one on the top is obviously mixing the um, AEC channels uh, that's going to go to the far end callers. The bottom room combined module is is <clears throat> managing all of the references and ultimately what would go to the speakers. Okay, and they're just linked. So when I combine one room combined module, it combines the other one. So they're just they just have the same controller numbers combined to them. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the setup procedure. Um, this this is kind of my uh, my process that I would go through um, to set up a conference room. Okay, so you've already de designed your site file, you've installed everything, you've hooked everything up, and now you're going to make sound. Okay, so step one. <laughs> Um, I think you'd want to start with the power amps turned all the way down. Um, this is the way that I do it. Um, because with a conference room, uh, the gain structure is very, very, very important. Um, and uh, hopefully you choose a power amp that actually has gain control on it, um, as opposed to an amp that is just on or off. 
um, because this will help you to set the best gain structure. Okay, so starting with the amp completely off, we're gonna push our site file, and then we are going to check the microphone gains. So gain structure, you know, it all starts with the microphones. That's the beginning point of the gain structure. And you wanna get the microphones so that they're reading at about minus 20 on the meters. And if you do that, then everything else should be really, really easy. So first step of your gain structure is get the microphones coming in correctly. Um, and again, we want right about minus 20 on average. If it goes a little above that or a little below that, depending on the talker, that's okay. But in the most average scenario, you want those microphones reading at about minus 20. Now, just as a side note, you know, all of our metering in the software is in DBFS, um, DB full scale. So that minus 20 zone is sort of like our unity gain equivalent, you know, of, you know, zero VU, we'll call it, or whatever. Um, whereas if the meters go all the way up to zero, that's like plus 24. That's going to be clipping, right? So minus 20 is our unity gain. That's, that's our Goldilocks zone for the gain structure from the input all the way to the output, honestly. So starting with the mic gain first, you get your minus 20, and then move on. Okay, so then we're talking about the gain structure throughout the whole rest of the system, from the inputs all the way to the outputs. So we want to get the gain structure on any presentation audio that's coming in. Um, you know, the, the I put a red box around basically everything in here that has control of the gain. And here's a little piece of advice for you. If you leave everything at zero, if, <laughs> if you leave every fader at zero, that is going to be your best bet to integrate this system easily. Um, if you start adjusting things, like if you turn the PC audio up on the input module and then <clears throat> you go to the mono mono mixer and you turn the PC audio down a little bit and then you go to the gain module 218 and you turn that up a little bit and then you go to the four channel analog output and you've turned that down a little bit, you've just really, really complicated the gain structure. And uh, I can tell you in a lot of situations when <clears throat> people call into support and they've got gain structure issues, we go through and we zero everything out first. <laughs> and, and that just makes it easier uh, to get a good gain structure or to get a handle on things at least. Anyway, so I, uh, again, I put a red box around everything, everywhere where you could adjust the gain structure. And the point being, probably leave everything at zero at this point. Um, there's no reason, since you haven't made sound yet, <clears throat> that anything should be not at zero. So moving on to the next step. So at this point, this is what when we want to actually establish a call. So if you're doing USB, you're going to make your Zoom call, get somebody out in the hallway or in a different room that <clears throat> so that with patients that can uh, establish a call with you, or if it's a VoIP call, you're gonna actually make a, make a phone call to that person, have somebody on their cell phone or whatever it is um, out, in, out in the hallway or in a different room. And <clears throat> once you actually have the far end caller coming in through the system, then you're gonna bring the amplifier volume up to the appropriate volume in the room. And I can't stress that enough. That's what makes life super easy when you're integrating in a, a, a conferencing system. You got the whole gain structure, microphones are coming in at minus 20 dB, everything else is at zero across the board. You make a call and then you bring the volume up on the amps to the appropriate volume that you would want it to be in the room. And then you leave your amps right there. Then you are in the, everything's in the ballpark at that point, okay? So the next step, if you need to make any other adjustments, <clears throat> if you need to adjust the near end mics, turn them up or down for the far end, you can do that. Um, and then uh, next step, you're going to look at, th then you can look at the ERL levels and the ERLE levels. Again, once you actually have the far end caller coming in through the, and coming out of the speakers in the room, getting picked up by the microphones, that's when something will actually show up. 
on the ERL and ERLE meters, but not until then. Um, so again, we want the ERL meter to be a negative number. Um, around minus 20 is ideal, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but again, the ERL is, it's basically a visual indication of how hard the AEC process has to work to remove the echo. Um, it's normally gonna be a negative number. If it's positive or really negative, then it's gonna indicate a gain structure problem. So at this point, hopefully don't adjust the amplifiers. Okay, next step, if you, if the far end caller is telling you they still have a little bit of echo, you could try NLP, maybe moving that to medium if you need it. Um, it, NLP, it, it's useful for removing like a secondary or like kind of like an indirect echo that might come through or reverb. It kind of works on that. A little bit. Um, it can be useful and transparent to the participants. However, if you do use NLP on high, in if it's a really troublesome, you know, really echoey, really reverby environment, that actually can reduce double talk performance and clarity a little bit. And I'll talk about that a little bit more too. <clears throat> okay, noise cancellation. Um, so this is where you would enable noise cancellation. If at this point, the far end caller is telling you, wow, I'm hearing like this constant hum sound or a buzz, and you realize one of the microphones is hanging right next to the projector fan. Um, that's where noise cancellation comes in, where that could eliminate that on certain microphones. And then finally, engage AGC um, if you if you need to compensate for varying distances between the near end and participants and their microphones. It basically attempts to maintain a consistent level um, for better intelligibility. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit more um, in a second here, but if you're doing auto mixing, you probably don't want to use the AGC here. So, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that coming right up. Okay, so troubleshooting. Say you've gone through all those steps and you still have a little echo slipping through the far end. So step one, start at the beginning, make sure that uh, the reference is, is tapped off at the right place. That's the first thing I'm gonna look at if you call me for support. Um, and then make sure that the, uh, the reference level is good okay if you need to add a meter here to see what the uh what the reference level is in this case it's, it's such a simple site file it's exactly the same as it would be on the on the uh, analog output assuming it's at zero but <clears throat> we like a hot reference um and so that's that's a well-known and well-documented thing i think um Above minus 10, actually. So if there's anything that shouldn't be at minus 20 from input to output, it's the reference. The reference should be about 10 dB hotter um, than everything else. And if you get the reference um, goosed up there a little bit, it's above minus 10, that I think, in all my years of working with our AEC, that's what makes it sound the best and get the best performance, okay? <clears throat> All right, so if you've already tried NLP or if it's on lower medium, you might try high. If you still have uh, some echo slipping through, um, I was going to say if you if you need to add a trim module right before the reference itself, so obviously the end user wouldn't have control of that. In this picture, the end user would have control of the gain 218 module, so that would turn up the speaker in the room and the reference simultaneously. But if you need to add a little trim here just to boof, to goose the reference up, that's totally common. So you could use that trim module to boost it 10 dB if you need to, to get the, the gain that you need. Um, and that would be perfectly acceptable. 
Um, again, NLP, if you need to put that on medium or high as a troubleshooting step, you could try that. So let's talk about double talk a little bit, and that's, you know, because NLP really affects that. Um, double talk is a condition when both the, the far end and the near end people are talking at the same time. <laughs> so say they're arguing, you, you're in a conference call and people are trying to talk over each other at the same time. That is called double talk. That is the most difficult scenario for the echo canceller, canceller algorithm to deal with, actually. Um, so when that condition occurs, the AEC algorithm may not achieve as much echo reduction and even miss small portions of the acoustic echo. So it's not a very common occurrence, and maybe it kind of depends on the people using the system. And there is also not anything different about Symmetrix's AEC performance that's any worse or better than other manufacturers' AEC performance in that regard. Double talk um, is really hard <clears throat> for, for the algorithm to deal with in any situation. But NLP or nonlinear processing does suppress um, its ability to handle double talk a little bit. So if you have NLP on high, you might notice that the performance of double talk, performance during double talk is worse than when NLP is on low. Okay. So troubleshooting positive ERL values, okay? So if the ERL level is a positive number, that could mean that the amplifier is too high. It could means that mean that the mics are too close to the speakers or they're pointed directly at the speakers. That's just poor design from the beginning. Um, it could mean that the input gain on the mics could be too high. So the mics might be going, you know, the level on the mics are getting way above minus 20. That could be part of the problem. Um, it could be not high enough signal going to the AEC. So if the AEC's uh, reference signal is too low, if it's minus 20 or lower going into the reference signal, that could be why. Um, but ultimately, the gain structure is not optimized if you're seeing a positive ERL level. Um, this little handy chart kind of helps um, clarify that a little bit. So again, if it's a positive um, ERL value, the amp could be too high uh, or the AEC reference could be too low or something like that. Um, a solution could be to lower the amp volume, kind of go back to setting up, s s turn the amp all the way down and set the gain structure and turn the amp up to, the, you know, kind of go back with the step-by-step -step procedure I showed you before. Um, or increase the signal going into the reference, that could help. Now, you'll see the green line there. If if your uh, ERL value is down about minus 20, minus 18-ish, that is ideal. I mean, you probably don't hear any echo in that situation. You've probably got really good results if that's the case. Now, if it's a really, really negative value, like much lower than minus 20, that is could mean that the mic levels are too low or the ref the reference could be too high in that case so you can easily make some adjustments there okay so just a couple more tips here and we're almost done um if you're if you're using agc so this is one thing i said we were going to talk about with auto mixing um, keep, keep in mind that an, an, an auto mixer's job is to make loud sounds louder and soft sounds softer. And an AGC's job is the opposite of that. <laughs> so if you do want to use AGC, you'd be better off doing it something more like this. Just add an AGC module on the mixed output after the auto mixing. Um, you know, basically you don't want to do dynamics processing before an auto mixer, I think is the main point I'm trying to get across here. Um, and this would be a better way to, better better practice way to do it. Okay. Um, one other thing to point out, if you're doing Teams, um, you know, or Zoom or BlueJeans or Skype or Microsoft Link or anything like that, keep in mind that those programs have their own AEC built in. Um, they might have AGC built, built in too. 
So if you've gone to all this work to use your Radius NX with you know fancy acoustic echo cancellation, and if you've got your expensive microphones and all of that, you, you're gonna wanna disable that in the software um, so that they're not conflicting with each other. Uh, I've definitely run into that where uh, if you've got uh, you know the, the built-in echo cancellation on Skype or Zoom, fighting with our AEC algorithm, then it gets bad, uh, bad sound. All right. A couple other just pieces of advice here at the end is basically when you're designing a system, um, you want to kind of consider a few things. You want to maintain as much separation from the microphones and the speakers as possible. The microphones should be as far from the speakers as possible and as close to the talkers as possible. Now, I realize that's not always um, possible based on what the end what the end user wants, but you should consider those things at the very beginning stages of designing a conference room. Um, that. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to push for having those microphones right in front of the people. And if they don't want that, then okay, then you're gonna have microphones on the table. Oh, and if they don't want that, then you're gonna have microphones hanging from the ceiling. And if they don't want that, then you're gonna have microphones equally as far away from the talkers as the speakers. And that is not ideal. You are not gonna get the best results in a design like that. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, there is uh, no substitution for acoustic treatment. You know, so this is one of those things that, you know, at the very beginning stages of designing a conference room, you should throw this out there straight away that, hey, we're going to have carpet, uh, you know, have some acoustic panels, you know, whatever you can do. Um, you know, you can't obviously make it look like a recording studio sometimes in fancy conference rooms. And I also realized that kind of a very popular conference room look nowadays is glass everywhere and hard surfaces and hard surface everything. But you know, obviously when it comes to sound, that is not gonna be ideal for sound. So whatever you can get away with in the beginning, trying to fit some kind of acoustic, uh, something to suck up the reflections will, will just make it easier to make it actually sound good. Um, and it's going to be hard to go backwards later. So if you don't mention any of this stuff and you, you end up um, with a room that is all hard surfaces everywhere, it's kind of had to, hard to get them to add acoustic panels later. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyways, uh, something to keep in mind there. All right, so then I just wanted to circle around really quick and talk uh, again about VoIP. Um, I kind of added this at the end um, just uh, because this is all part of configuring a, uh, uh, a conference room. You may need to configure our voice over IP card and it's pretty easy. Um, in the Composer software, you would click the configuration settings button and that opens up this interface where you can launch the web interface to um, enter the VoIP card information. You can launch that through the AV network or the VoIP network. Um, and it's actually a really handy feature that we have that you can launch through the AV network um, because uh, that uh, you'll always have access to that. You'll al already be connected to the AV network using Composer software. And so that makes it really easy. Anyway, so you're going to log, launch into the web interface, and then we're going to um, enter um, these these items in the identification tab, uh, the display name, username, domain name, and local phone number. And also, we've got a tech tip that explains what, you, what each one of these items is as well. I won't dwell on it too much here. Um, and then on the authentication tab, we've got three tabs here to fill in. And then finally, on the server tab. Uh, three item, uh, two items to fill in there. And then once you have filled in the correct information, then your VoIP card should be registered. And that's what it'll look like. It'll say registered in green over there on the left. 
Okay, and then uh, we're almost finished here. I just wanted to talk about a couple control options that we have as well. Uh, so don't forget, Symmetrics makes control options. We make this really cool um, unit called the PD1. Um, this is a hardware dialer. Um, it's PoE powered. It has a backlit LCD screen. This can be used with our voice over IP card or the analog telephone interface card. Um, it's really, really, really simple to configure. Um, it has um, speed dials that you can access. Um, you also have, um, you know, redial, um, mute, hold, volume controls that you can assign as well. Um, so this is a pretty sweet little unit. Um, if you have a, uh, um, uh, a voice over IP card that has two lines, you could use two PD1s. So again, you could use one voice over IP card and one Radius NX for two rooms, and you could have two PD1s um, to control those. And then don't forget that we can make SimView control screens uh, to control the system. And these could be used on our T5 um, touch screen, or it could be used with control server. And with control server, you could use any device with a web browser. So you could even use an iPad as the control system. And that could be a pretty cool way to do it. Um, here's another uh, design idea um, using control server, um, controlling one line of our VoIP card. And then don't forget, we have Arc Web Dialer as well. This is free, this comes with Radius NX. You don't need a control server. Um, this is a web interface that you can configure very easily in the Composer site file. You don't have to design the GUI itself, uh, yourself. Um, so this is a really, really easy control system that you could use as a web interface. And then finally, we have, uh, we do have a Crestron module available on our website that you can use. Um, we've actually had it for years. Thousands of people have used it. Um, this is kind of what it looks like here. And you can download that from our website or from the Crestron store. And uh, I'm not a Crestron programmer, programmer myself, but you can, if you know Crestron programming, you can see it's the standard, uh, standard Crestron module stuff there. And that's pretty much it. I'm gonna hang out for a little bit and see if I have any questions from anybody. Um, and let's look in the chat and see if there's any questions in there. Okay, here's a question from Adam. I see both gain sharing and gating auto mixers used in the examples. Do you have a preference? Aha, you caught me on that one. So, you know, um, for large channel counts, I think gating is better. Um, for going to the far end collar, I think gating is better, but for local reinforcement on small channel counts, I always think gain sharing sounds better. Um, so that's why I did that. Um, over the years, I've kind of gone back and forth and in my experience, I think that's what works best. So that's why that's how I did that in my examples. Hopefully that's, that answers your question. One thing that's nice about gating auto mixers, um, that you can't do with gain sharing auto mixers is that you have a, a nom limit, which means number of open microphones. And so, you know, in a situation where you've got 16 microphones or 32 microphones in a room, that nom limit really comes in handy because you can set that to two or three or maybe even four maximum microphones that can be open at one time. And so that really helps with the with the noise and what's coming out the other side. So, yeah. Okay, here's another question. Has it been tested with 8.0? It sure has. I actually, uh, yes, we've tested all of it with 8.0, absolutely. Um, oh, the Crestron module. Yeah, no difference there. Um, it, our control protocol has never changed. So yeah, there should be no issues there on the Crestron module. Um, and here's one more question. Uh, is it going to be archived? You bet this webinar will be archived. Um, I could imagine we'll we'll have it up uh, by the end of the day or probably by tomorrow or at least by the end of the week for you um, to watch later. So it looks like I've worked through all the questions. Um, thanks everybody for sticking with me. I went a little bit over my hour, but uh, I really appreciate everybody's patience and 
and going through this with me. All right. Well, everybody have a great day.